If you could turn to Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, we won't be there for a while yet. But we're going to talk, we're going to call this series Beware of the Trojan Horse. It's going to be a 10 session or 10 week series. Then we're going to get into the book of Revelation. Now I have a reason for going through this first because you will understand when we get to Revelation what I mean by going through this. Because this is very important, extremely important. And I'm going to say some things today that I don't think many of us have heard for a long time in churches today. And I'm going to try not to be harsh when I go through that. But we're going to talk a little bit about, about hell today. So I titled this Warning, Warning, Warning. Now, the series we're going to go through in your bulletin, it has a list. And let me go through this just real quick with you. I got this idea from a friend of mine named Tom Kakuza, who's pastor of Northland Bible Baptist Church up in St. Cloud, Minnesota. He did a series like this. And his is going to, uh, mine's going to be a little different than his because everybody's a little bit different. I'm going to cover some little bit different topics this is. And so, but he gave me an idea that, what this is all about is a Trojan horse back in like 1200 B.C., and I don't know if this is myth or true, or actually did happen. Uh, supposedly, when the Greeks were fighting the city of Troy, they made this big wooden horse, and it was hollow inside, and they put 30 men inside of it, and they pushed this horse up to the uh, walled city of Troy to the gate and gave it to, as a gift to their goddess called, I think it was Athena of Troy, and so the people of Troy came and drug this horse inside their gates and closed the door. But inside, hidden inside this horse, were 30 soldiers from the Greeks. And they came out and they killed them. They opened up the gates and they all come in. And they defeated um, the city of Troy. So it came to be that when we talk about a Trojan horse, it's something that's subtle or sneaky that looks good on the outside, doesn't look very harmless. And that's what happens sometimes in the church. This stuff creeps into the church. Now, we know when we talk about, like, Trojan horse and software, we refer to that as, what, malware or a virus. So this, this stuff is, is something that we can think about, and this is something we need to be concerned about in the church. So I'm going to go through these, these ten um, sessions here. The first one is warning, warning, warning. And we're going to answer the, reason, the question, why are we doing this? And the reason we're doing this is because heaven and hell are real. It's important enough. That's why. Number two is salvation too easy. There's those that say, you guys just make it too easy. And we just, they want to make it hard. And so we're going to discuss that in week two. The truth is Jesus did it all. Capital A, capital L, capital L. <laughs> he did it all. We don't do anything. We do the sin and he does the saving. So that's why the next one is going to be, why is it too easy? Why do people say it's too easy? Well, a lot of times it's because of pride, right? So the third one is drowning in baptism. And I don't want to scare any of you guys that are getting baptized, okay? <laughs> but we're going to talk about baptism. Some people take a couple little verses out of the Bible and they make a doctrine out of them, whereas they ignore about 40, 50 other verses, which are so clear. And so we're going to discuss these and understand this the best we can. And then we're going to look at willfully sinning away your salvation. And number four, can you affect your salvation that you can go from saved to unsaved? Well, if that's true, then eternal life doesn't mean eternal life. But there are those that teach that. So we're going to discuss that in number four. Number five, lordship salvation. Is it biblical? Now, what do I mean by lordship salvation? It all sounds all good and all right. But the truth is, have any of you truly made Jesus Lord of your life? <laughs> I haven't. We all fail. And the, we have to separate salvation from discipleship, right? Discipleship is we want to be more like Christ. We want to make him Lord of our life. We want to live for him. But can you make him Lord of your life as a salvation requirement? No, then that would be good works, wouldn't it? So we have to separate the two, and we'll talk about that in, in that one because there's many big-name theologians out there that are teaching that if you don't make Jesus Lord of your life, you're not saved. And basically, you have to do your part along with Jesus. So we'll discuss that when we get to that. Um, salvation out of control. We're going to review some more verses that are taken out of context that people s muddy up the gospel with and say you can lose your salvation. Growing tulips. We're going to bring a little garden here. We're going to plant tulips. <laughs> tulips is an acronym. Who all knows what tulip stands for? Okay, some of you do, right? It's a Calvinistic acronym, and its Calvinism is creeping into the church more than you can possibly believe. And so tulip stands for total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Some of these sound kind of good, but we'll explain these in detail, how they are different than what we believe. And this is also subtle, and, but it's important to understand this. Then we're going to talk about true and false repentance. If you look at a dictionary, or take a couple of dictionaries, and look up the word repentance, you're going to get anywhere from five to seven different meanings in the dictionary. 
but what did it originally mean? What does it really truly mean in the Bible? What is the Greek word? What did it mean? And we're going to discuss that and understand that pretty good when we're done with this. Then we're going to talk about contemplative Christianity, and that is about the New Age. Now, you know, New Age kind of slightly crept into the church. You ever hear the book called Jesus Calling? We'll talk about that. Okay, don't get all shook up yet. And we're going to discuss it. And we're going to talk about contemplative prayer, what is right, what is wrong with the prayer that some of people use today. And we'll get a good understanding of how subtle and sneaky this is in Christianity today. I think this is good for us. And our whole goal is number 10, gospel discernment. We want to make sure we truly understand the gospel, what is and what isn't the gospel, right? You agree with me on that? That's our goal, number 10, to truly understand it. Let me ask you a question. If you go to the bank and you refinance your house, and they say, okay, we got a loan for you here for 5.9%. Wonderful. Then you start paying your loan and you find out they're charging you 6.3%. Would you freak out? You'd go back and say, something's wrong. I mean, that's important, 0.4%. That's very important. We're not going to allow that. You told us 5.9. Or let's say you went to the doctor and he gave you some medicine. And he, you went home and in a bottle said, take two of these a day. So you're taking two. The next time you went to the doctor... He said, have you been taking your medicine one a day like I told you? And you say, you didn't tell me one a day. It says in a bottle two a day. No, no, I told you, you better be taking one a day. You'd get a little shook up, wouldn't you? I mean, confusing. And that's the truth about Christian. Why do we say that is such a big deal, yet it's okay to say one thing on the gospel? You listen to the radio, you'll hear one message. You watch a pastor on TV, you hear something different. And most people, it just blows, they don't even pay any attention to what's being said. But you have to have discernment. Because not everything that comes across the supposed gospel is the true, accurate gospel. But after this, these 10 um, messages, I believe you truly will understand it. And it's good. I go through this. It reinforces my knowledge, and it helps me to have a better, clearer understanding of it. And I think it will you, too. I think this is going to be somewhat of these things are going to be an eye-opener to you and I as far as, far as our study here. But I think this is very good for us. We have to have discernment. We have to be able to distinguish between the true gospel in a false gospel. And so we'll do that, and I think that'll be a good thing for us to go through it. So, beware of the Trojan horse. I explained to you what the Trojan horse was. We went through that list. We're going to go look at Galatians 1, verse 8 and 9 today, and that is a warning. Warning, warning, warning. Who's ever heard that before? Any that's old enough probably have, right? <laughs> Back, there was a show in 1965, and it was called Lost in Space. And it went for like three seasons. And it's, well, his robot came out, warning, warning, warning. Now, some of you have never heard of it. Some of you might have. The very next year, Lost uh, Star Trek came out in 1966. So that Lost in Space show kind of got petered out because, hey, Lost uh, Star Trek was a high-tech show at the time, right? It's, but this was more of a cutesy show, and I'll show you a, a little video of it here in just a second. But that's why I titled this, because we need to be warned, as it says in Galatians 1, verse 8 and 9. Now, who agrees that today our world has problems? that we're going into problems, okay? Anybody not agree? Does it bother you a little bit? Well, what, are they, what does a lot of the world say the problem is? They say, well, it's nationalism. We need to break down our borders and we need to become one with the world. That kind of sounds like fitting in with the Antichrist, doesn't it? Or the one world government, the one world religion, the one world economy. We hear this stuff over and over. The only way you can't hear it is if you hit your, stick your head in the sand. It's pretty out in the open now. 10, 20 years ago, this was more subtle and not as obvious, but it's becoming more and more obvious. Just pay attention to what you're going on, and you see that our world wants to develop into a one-world government. They call it today disunity because there's those that disagree, and we need to bring everybody together. They use this term global warning, warming, right? Okay. They also use this pandemic to help to get, to get us un, under control. And they are really against those to the far right, conservatives, and you and I Bible believers. We actually are the enemy to them because we stand up for truth. So please understand that. That's what they say is wrong with the world today. But you really know what's wrong with the world today? The Bible calls it sin. And so in Romans 1 verse 24 through 32, we talked about during our Thursday Bible study, we discussed this. Our world is on a tra trajectory going downhill. It's like a cesspool. We're just going down worse and worse and worse. In fact, they say that most of the pornography that has gone throughout the world, 90% or so comes from the United States. That's pretty bad. It really is. And yet things are getting worse and worse. And there's that saying, and I mentioned this Thursday night, that pretty soon we're going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because how things bad are. 
and maybe that's not a good illustration or not, but I believe we're in what's called the days of Noah. In 1 Peter 3.20, God said he's long-suffering toward us as he was in the days of Noah, and only eight people got saved at that time. That was bad. And it says in 2 Peter 3.9 that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to change their mind about sin and about who the Savior is. So we are in perilous times. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 5. If you want to read them verses later, verses 1 through 5 of 2 Peter chapter 3, they will tell you what times in, we're in today. Now, you may have looked at that 10 years ago and 20 years ago and said, oh, it's not that bad. It's always been kind of like this throughout the ages. But today it's worse than it's ever been. So when you read them verses today, you have to come to the conclusion they nailed it for our day and age. Seriously. Okay, we're in perilous times. Now, how in the world did we get there? How do we get in this present condition we're in? Well, there's a manual or a book, and it's called the Bible, that tells you all about it. And it'll take you back there. But today, biblical truth has become diluted. You know what diluted is? How many of you go to a, a McDonald's and you get a Coke and it tastes like water and you say, what is going on here? Or coffee. It's diluted. And that's what happens to Christianity in the Bible today. It's diluted because nobody wants to say anything that's going to cause division or be strong on any certain doctrine. Um, the gospel has been watered down. Nobody knows really what the gospel is anymore. You hear one one week, one another week, and it's so foggy. It's mixed, it's polluted, it's muddy, it becomes murky. How would you like a clear glass of water and you go to drink it and you look at it, it looks kind of dirty, right? Well, that's what's happened to the gospel. It's become murky. So, that's why I tell this warning, warning, warning. It's a message warning us about the false, false gospel. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning. Warning. And here's the warning. Of warning. Biophysical experiments extremely dangerous to earth people. How many of you have seen that before? Okay. That was a show that was about 1960s. I was just a young little fella at the time. But it was a cute show. It was more of a family show. And then Star Trek came out and it kind of debunked that show. But that was back then, warning, warning, aliens are approaching. Well, I think the aliens today are the aliens that are coming into the church with false doctrine. So we always have to be ready. But let's go ahead and look at where this started from the beginning. Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make man in our image. God is a trinity. We are a body, soul, and spirit after our likeness. God created you and I after his image. So whenever a baby is aborted, you're killing somebody created after God's image. Think about it. And 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Did I read that correctly? I better change that. We better get some new modern version. It says they're male and female. I can't think you can have the choice today. Um, I went to an off supply store on Creasy. This may have been a year or two ago, and now it's not there anymore. It's closed down. But I asked the young lady, I says, ma'am, can you help me find something? Oh, did I say the wrong thing? I'm not a ma'am, I'm a sir. And I was like, okay, okay, but you look like a ma'am. <laughs> so at least somewhat. I'm not trying to be snotty or mean, but truthfully, you have to be, what do you say? How do you, how do you know? You be careful. Uh, if I would have said something else, you know, maybe they want to be identified as a cat, you know, meow, meow. I don't know. It's just become very confusing today, isn't it? You kind of... You're kind of lost or beat before you say or do anything. And that's just the problem today. Everybody is so sensitive. Most churches today, I think, have gone woke. You know what woke means? Woke is the past tense of wake. They say they woke up and all these social injustices going on in the world. And they blow these out of proportion so that they have some kind of agenda they can stand for. And yet, that is not the truth. That is not from the Bible. In 1 Timothy 4, 2, it says the lies of the hypocrisy. So we have to understand that. But it's evolved into so all these different injustices have taken sports over and so on and so on. And people get sucked into this. And that's the sad thing about it. And even churches do. Okay, so Genesis 131, it tells us, And God saw everything, that's the totality, he says everything, that he had made, and behold, it was very or exceedingly good or pleasant. It was exceedingly pleasant. When God made everything in this world, could you imagine paradise? We live in it. Could you imagine how great that would be? Well, it will be. But then the morning, the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God created literal six days he created this world. Now, there are some that believe in theistic evolution. Now, I don't know if you, you know what theistic evolution is. That's the idea. Theos means God. It means God 
started it, and then things evolved. In other words, God made the goo and the thing inside the goo, and that came out and evolved into human beings. That's called theistic evolution. There's a predominant uh, preacher that you may have heard of, Tim Keller. He believes in this. He believes that in theistic evolution. A lot of them try to square away this with science and say it's scientific to believe in evolution, but that's their best thing to replace God was evolution. Now tell me this. Something comes out of that goo. It's a single cell amoeba or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. Then it dies. Where does the information come for it to evolve? Because it comes out, it dies, comes out, it dies. At what point does it come out and say, okay, I got to have children? How does it do that? That's scientific. You got to figure this out, right? The smart people can figure this out. And that's what they think. Or it comes out, then another one comes out. Okay, this one came out as a male. This one came out as a female. The whole thing is ridiculous. But people believe that. That's their best answer for against God creating everything. I mean, do you see how ridiculous that is? Um, when I was up in Bemidji, Minnesota, I had a Bible study at Bemidji State University. This was back when I was like a young 30-year-old, okay? I was somewhat naive. And I had this Bible study, and the college students were coming to it. And one week I said I was going to uh, teach on creation evolution, and I studied up on it, and I put all these posters up back when you could do that. So this week, like a dozen people showed up, and, you know, it was set up, and I didn't know it. <laughs> and one of the guys that was in there was a biological professor, and he invited all his students to come. And so I went through and explained the difference between creation and evolution. I gave the gospel clearly, and I hope when I get to heaven someday I'll see one of these students in heaven because I try to give it the gospel as clear as I could. Well, here's the thing. At the very end, this guy raises his hand and starts spouting off all this scientific jargon, and I try to answer him the best I could. Then afterwards, I, this one kid comes up to me, and he says, I never really understood evolution either until I got into my graduate degree and, and going for my master's degree. Well, okay. But that's, that's the sad thing about this, isn't it? Think about it. You have these people, or amoebas, or whatever they are that evolve, then all of a sudden, this orange, this seed says, I'm going to become an orange so you can eat me, so you can have something to live on. Then one says, I'm going to become a banana, I'm going to become an apple, so we have diversity, so you can all eat the different ones. Now, does that make any sense? It sounds like it was designed, doesn't it? When you sit down for breakfast, you have different things that were made, right? Somebody sat there and said, I'm going to make this, this, and this. This is all designed. We're designed. I worked at SIA for 15 years. Cars are designed down to the nth detail. I mean, it's, it's crazy how much design goes into a, an automobile. Do you think you and I biologically are a little more complicated than an automobile? You think we could just evolve? I don't think so. I'm not here to knock these people, but it is sad, isn't it? When they reject God, that God created this world in six days. Okay, Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. This is choice. This is free will. They may choose or to eat it or not. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Do you know when God created mankind, Adam and Eve, they were to live forever. He made them that way. Someday we'll live forever. But when she decided to listen to Satan, and I'll read the verse here in just a second, Mankind, death passed along mankind. Now, physical death, and then the second death, which is spiritual death, okay? So at that, that point, you needed to have a Redeemer or a Savior, and that's where you see in Genesis 3.15 where God had said he's going to send a Savior eventually, okay? That early, truthfully. Okay, look at uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and 4. Now, the serpent. Now, the serpent originally wasn't somebody crawling along the ground. That's when he got cursed. What he looked like or what it was, I don't know. But it says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And I believe this was Satan speaking through this serpent. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Now who's the father of lies? Right? Satan is right. And he's telling a big fat lie right here. And Eve fell for it. I mean, she believed it. She ate of the fruit. And then Adam ate of the fruit, and sin came upon mankind. That's where this all started. That's where sin came into the world, okay? Everybody understand that? It's obvious. You learned this in Sunday school as a kid, right? But here, let's go ahead and move on and look at the next one. Because it's, for, it's important for us just to understand these basics, okay? And I know, I, know, I know you guys do, and I hope all of you do. But Ecclesiastes 7.20, this is Jason's favorite book, he said. Back in the 
book of Ecclesiastes, it says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Do you know that? That's what God said in his word. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you may be sitting here thinking, Well, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm not a sinner. Yes, you are. You're a liar. Because God said you're a sinner. And if you say you're not a sinner, then you're lying. Right? So that's the truth. Lying is a sin. In fact, James 4.17 says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you were walking out of the grocery store and some elderly person in front of you spilled all the groceries on the ground and you says, i got to get home and make dinner, I can't help them. You know it would be good to help them, right? But you don't do it. In any instance where you know it's something good to do and you don't do it, the Bible in James 4.17 says that's sin. So we're all stuck. We're all sinners. Every one of us. We're sinners, and because we're sinners, we deserve the penalty for sin. So what is sin? Well, it's the Greek word hamartano. And hamartano means to miss the mark, to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law. It's like this. You put a sign up on a goalpost, and you know the targets you shoot at with arrows, and in the middle it has a little bullseye in the center, and you have a thousand footballs, and you're, out, you're on the other side of the field, 110 yards away. And every day you have to throw a thousand footballs and hit the center of that bullseye, otherwise you miss the mark. Impossible, right? First of all, who can throw a football 100 yards, right? I don't think Peyton Manning could. Maybe 50, maybe 60 of that. But 100 yards and hit that bullseye every time. You do it every day, every day. And that's what the Bible says. Eventually we all sin. In fact, a child sins pretty quickly, don't they, when they start fussing because they want you to baby them. Okay, some of us fuss and cry when we're older, we get baby too, but that's beside the point. <laughs> okay, but anyways, you see what I'm saying? You missed the mark, that's what it means. We all missed the mark. That's what that word sin means. It means to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law. And you see the picture of sin, it's a burden. If that man has that big, gigantic, heavy rock on his ankle and you throw him over the side of the ship, what's going to happen to him? He's going to sink to the bottom pretty quick, isn't he? Okay, But that's what sin does. Is sin will drag us to hell. And so, we know Romans 3.23, or Romans 6.23. The wages or payment of sin is death, and that's hell. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about hell today. And sometimes, people don't want to go to church and hear about hell. But it's in the Bible. You have to talk about it. If we're going to have the whole full counsel of God, we have to talk about hell. So, please, understand, this is only from the Bible, and this is God's Word. So, the wages or penalty of sin is death, and that's hell. That's the second death. We all will die physically unless we get raptured, or we'll die the second death, which is spiritual death. Okay? They say that everybody is born once. If you trust Christ as Savior, you're born twice, and you'll die once. If you don't trust Christ as Savior, you're born once, but you'll die twice, because you'll die the physical death and the second death. Okay? So... Which are, which are we? It's important that you get born twice by trusting Christ as Savior. So we see this. Wake up in hell. Horrific. Now hell is not the grave. Hell is not dirt. I have this one friend of mine from many, many years ago. He says, when I die, I'm just going to turn back to dirt. Well, I'm sorry. It's worse than that. This is truth. This is reality. It's not just the grave. Some people believe that hell is probably in the center of the earth. I don't know where hell is actually at. But in the Old Testament, they refer to as Sheol, and New Testament's Hades. Now, Sheol and Hades will eventually be cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the final hell. Uh, it talks about in the Old Testament another word which you've probably heard of, Tartarus. And Tartarus is where the fallen angels are kept. So that's a separate compartment of hell. And if you study the, the doctrine of hell, it's, it gets pretty deep. Okay. And then in the New Testament, that's referred to as the abyss. Remember, the demons got put into the abyss. But these all end up in the lake of fire, which is according to Revelation 19, verse 20. Now, in the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, it gives some terms or illustrations that kind of represent hell. You've all heard of the Valley of Hinnom, or the Valley of Gehenna. These were dumps outside of southern Jerusalem that had a fire going constantly, and they had burned all the garbage, and that fire just kept going and going. And many times, Jesus, like in, I think it was five, Matthew 5, 22, referred to that as a, as a type of hell, the way, you know, a good example of the way hell is. It's the fire that never ends. It keeps burning. So that was the Valley of Hinnon and the Valley of Gehenna. Uh, Revelation 9.11 refers to it as a bottomless pit. Now think about that. Bottomless pit. What does that tell you? It tells you people in hell have no, nothing solid or substantial. You're floating in space. When you die and you go to hell, 
your body reunites with your soul and you spend eternity floating in space. Suffering, painful, and it's called the second death. It's called the pit. So here's the thing. That's, you won't be with your friends. Your friends may be there. Hopefully they're not. If you had a choice, you'd go back and you'd tell your friends, don't come here. But it'll be too late then. So there are some denominations or false religions like Seventh-day Adventists. They say eventually you'll be annihilated, those in hell, and it'll, you'll just be gone. That's not the truth. That's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say that at all. Now, there's a guy up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Some of you may have heard of him. His name is Rob Bell. He wrote a book titled um, Love Wins. And what he says is eventually everybody's going to end up in heaven. Well, that's not justice. That's not God's justice. You have to, you have to accept his pardon for sin by trusting Christ as Savior. So everybody's not going to end up in heaven. It may sound good. He may build a big church. He may get a lot of people coming to his church. But that's not the truth, is it? Okay, so let's look a little more about hell before we get into our verse today. I have to be serious about this. I have to have some passion and emotion because this does bother me. But number one, hell is down. It's a pit. Isaiah 14, 15. And hell is the reason that I have to explain the severity or seriousness of a false gospel. Because a false gospel will cause somebody to go here. That's why. I mean, it's serious, isn't it? Number two, there are degrees of hell. Psalms 86, 13, and Luke chapter 10, verse 13 through 14. Do you know in Luke 10, verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in hell than for Chorazin and Bethsaida. What is that telling you? That some in hell will not be as serious or, or torturous as others. Now, tell, hell's going to be an awful place no matter what, but there are degrees of hell. It, the more you reject God's truth and light, the worse hell you'll have and the, and the more you sin. So works do matter. Works matter as far as maybe your degree in hell. Obviously, works won't get you to heaven, not at all. But here's the thing. There are degrees of hell. And hell is sorrowful, Psalms 18, 5. Hell is painful, Psalms 116, verse 3. You will not know others are in hell, uh, Proverbs 9, 18. You're not going to be hanging around with your buddy buddies having a party. Not even close. Hell is torment, Luke 16, 23. Hell is darkness, 2 Peter 2, 4. You won't see anything. You ever go in your closet and close the door and it's pure dark? And stay in there and stay in there and stay in there? Okay, hell is going to be much worse than that because it's painful. Hell is a lake of fire and the second death, according to Revelation 20, verse 14. Jesus believed in hell and spoke of it at least 16 times in the Gospel of Matthew 5, 22, 29, 30. He spoke of it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then in the book of Revelation, Jesus spoke of hell also. So Jesus believed in hell. If you believe in Jesus, you're going to believe in hell because he believed in it. He spoke of it an awfully lot. Uh, Jesus believed in hell and spoke of it, as I mentioned here, number nine. But number ten, hell is eternal. It is forever. It never ends. And that's Matthew 25, 46, Mark 9, 43, Hebrews 6, 2, and Jude chapter 1, verse 7. So, please, understand this is not a cartoon. This is reality, people. How many of us know people that may go here? You know what Kayana told me the other day? She sent me a text when I was texting her, seeing if she's ready for the music. She said she, she's talked to a person at her work, and that person's going to come to, out to church with her. Then she said she's invited a lot of people at her work. I mean, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And I know some of you have, have passed out these, these little tracts and pamphlets. It's not that difficult. This gives the gospel. If the person rejects it, they reject it, but you did your part. And all you have to do is, hey, I have a gift for you. Get a chance. Read this. Simple as that and see if they'll read it. They're free. Take as many as you want. I can supply more and more. But make sure you understand this, because this gives the clear gospel. And all of you can take and pass these out. I know you get a little nervous about it, but hey, I've never had anybody beat me yet <laughs> when I've passed them out. And for 99% of the time, people are okay with it. They'll thank you. They may give you a funny look, but very seldom. Most of them say thank you very much. And some people are like, wow, you gave me a track. Amazing. Um, only one person gave it back to me and says, give it to somebody else. Big deal. I mean, I, I survived that. You know, I didn't feel go away home crushed and all destroyed because of that. So it's not that hard of a thing to do. It's easy to do because this is important. This is reality. It's eternal regret. And once this happens, it's too late for anybody. So let's go on to the next and talk about a little bit what Jesus said. Now, you know in your Bibles... The red, red writing is from Jesus. Jesus wrote the red letter, like the red letter in the Bible. Um, John 3.19, it says this. And this is the condemnation, meaning damnation in hell, 
that light, which is Jesus, has come into the world. Jesus came into this world. And men love darkness or sin rather than light or purity because their deeds were evil. Jesus came into this world, but people rejected him because they did not like the light. John 12, 46, Jesus said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth in me should not live in darkness. Jesus gave us a way out of this darkness. And that's when he came and died on the cross for our sins, according to John 12, 46. The next verse, John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation or hell, but is passed from death, the second death, unto life or heaven. Okay, do you understand that? You hear his words, you understand it, you place your faith in him, he died on the cross for your sins, he gives you eternal life, and that's your escape from hell. Now, some people say, well, you're just trying to escape from hell. Well, yeah, I am. Okay, plus I'd love to be in heaven with Jesus for all eternity. Okay, so the next one, Ephesians 1.13. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. So what happened? You trusted in him after you heard the gospel it was explained to you. It's that simple. When you found out that Christ gave his life on the cross of Calvary for you, you trusted him. So in whom, Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now the rest of that verse says you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, I didn't put that up there, but isn't that clear? Isn't that easy and neat how John 5, 24, Ephesians 1, 13, you first have to hear it and understand it, then you have to make the decision, I'm going to accept it or I'm going to reject it. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You've seen these verses many times. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Is there any clearer verse in the Bible than that? For by grace, receiving what you don't deserve, it's God's favor. Salvation is from the danger of hell. Faith is trust, rely, depend upon. In fact, I have the words right here. So for by grace, chorus, God's favor to you. Something given out of love, right? Do you ever give somebody something out of love when they don't deserve it? Anybody that's been a parent's done that, right? <laughs> okay, God's favor toward us. He gave us salvation even though we didn't deserve it. Sozo is saved. It means to rescue from danger of destruction and hell. That's what the context is talking about. It's about talking about hell. Every time that word sozo is used, it doesn't always refer to your eternal destiny because it can be referred to something else, you know. But in this case, it is referring to your salvation of your cell, soul from hell. The next one, oh, did you notice I tried to move this up a little higher? <laughs> I can't go any higher, but I know kind of sitting in the back, sometimes it's hard to look over people. But anyways, uh, faith, pistis, conviction of truth of anything. Synonyms, synonyms for faith is believe, trust, rely upon. You have faith, you trust, right? Let me do you a simple illustration here. And... Let me show you this. Pretend like this is a gold coin, okay? This is a gold coin. Now, how much would a gold coin this size be worth? I don't know. Do you know? Anybody know? Okay, I'm going to give you an example of what faith is or trust is, okay? I'm going to maybe put it in this box or I'm going to put it in my pocket. I'm not going to tell you, okay? Yet. So, I'm going to ask you a question. If you believe this is in a box, I will give you the gold coin. If you don't, you have to give me $100, okay? Anybody in for it? Here's the thing. Truly, truly, I did put it in a box. Honest, I did. As your pastor, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm telling you, before God, I put it in a box. It's in a box. If you trust me, you get the gold coin. Didn't Jesus say the same thing? Truly, truly, I give unto you eternal life. Didn't he? It just, if you simply believe in him, that's faith. If you have faith in me, if what I'm saying is true, it's the same way you have faith in Jesus Christ of what he's saying is true. You make that mind connection. He can read your mind. He understands. Now, I don't know if you believe me or not. You may be thinking, Bill's got a trick up his sleeve. Okay, <laughs> I don't know that. But I'm telling you, honestly, I did put it in here. And so if you believe me, this coin is yours. So if somebody came forward and said, I believe you, then I would hand it to you, okay? Now, Jesus, you don't have to go forward, raise your hand or anything. Once you connect with him in the spiritual realm and he reads your mind and he knows that you said you trust and believe in him, what does he give you? Eternal life. At that split second, you have eternal life. How long does eternal life last? Forever. Okay, so just to let you know, I did put it in there. See, I wouldn't lie to you, would I? <laughs> okay, so that's an example of, of placing your faith in what somebody says, okay? And that's what Jesus wants you to do. So John 6, 47 tells us, Truly, truly, I say unto you, 
he that believeth on me has everlasting life. The same verses that we have in front of this uh, lectern or pulpit here. Jesus said, truly, truly, honestly, honestly, amen, amen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. What does that believe mean? It means to trust him, to rely upon him. Everybody understand that? All the young people, elderly people, all of you guys, middle-aged people, okay, male, female, all of us, do we all understand that? It's pretty simple, isn't it? And that's what it says. So let's go ahead and move on. 2 Corinthians 5.21. I've gone through this a few times, and you pretty much understand it, but let me go through it again slowly. And here's what this verse means. He, for he God, for he God hath made him Jesus. For he God hath made him Jesus to be sin for us. You and I. Jesus would made sin for us. Who knew no sin? Jesus didn't know any sin. That we, you and I, might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the whole idea is, Jesus Christ was made sin for us, and if you trust him as your personal Savior, God sees you that your sins have been paid for. Your, his blood has washed away your sins. It's so amazing. It's a free gift because he loves you. Now let's go on to, now here's the thing. Here's a little bit of a catch. Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. Wait a second. You said all sin was forgiven. Now you're coming and telling me it's not all forgiven? No, it is all forgiven. Definitely 100%. Let's understand what this means. John 16, 18. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he reproves or convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit tries to get your attention and to get you to realize you're a sinner, you're not righteous, you're going to go into judgment. He gets you to do that. But some people can harden their minds to that, can't they? They can turn against it. So all sin has been paid for, but... When that pardon or that gift of it is finished is offered to you as a gift of salvation and you reject it or you want to add to it by doing something else, you know, what, what's God going to do? What can he do? If I offer you a gift and you say, well, I'm going to give you money for the gift. No, 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 no. I'm giving you this gift freely as a gift. It's that simple, isn't it? So Stephen had a problem with the Jewish people. And here's what happened to Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Acts 7, verse 51 he was brought before the consul, and he had to explain himself, and Stephen explained himself, and this is what he said in verse 51. You stiff-necked, or bull-headed, and uncircumcised, which means willfully blind, in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. So Stephen was telling these guys, you guys are bull-headed, you're not listening, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. What does that tell you? You can resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and tries to convict you of sin and to be saved. You can say, no, 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 I'm not interested. I'm not ready for that yet. I don't want that. Blah, 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 right? That's what the verse of the Bible is saying here. That's what Stephen says. They can resist the Holy Spirit. And so you and I could resist the Holy Spirit too. We could fight against it. But he offers that. It's a free will. It's the free will to say, I trust you or I reject you and don't trust you. And that's, that's where Stephen had a problem with these guys. Now, a few verses later, you know what happened to Stephen, right? He got stoned. He got killed. And he looked up and he seen Jesus at the right hand of God the Father. He died. I think he's the first martyr, right? At least in the New Testament, Stephen was. So, sad. But let's look at this verse again. I paraphrased it. Written in easier words to understand. God has made Jesus to be our sin, even though Jesus had no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Jesus. Is that simple to understand? He was made sin for us. He took all our sin upon himself and he paid for it. Um, to reject that, we reject it to our own peril, to our own demise, to our own hazard, don't we? People that reject that, it's so clear and simple. Why, how could you add to the gospel and make it more complicated that when it's that simple? I mean, please, seriously. Um, to not accept what Jesus has done for you is to reject it, isn't it? You can say, well, I'm just ignorant. No, you're not ignorant if you hear this. If you hear this and you reject it, you are responsible. God gives you the free will to make the decision for him or against him. So that's pretty simple. But I do fear, and the Apostle Paul had a fear. And you know what that fear is? Let's look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul said this, but I fear unless by any means, any means, anything, sneaking into church. I don't care if it's new age. I don't care if she ain't got to do this, do that. I fear by any means as the serpent begot, tricked Eve. The serpent was Satan as Satan beguiled Eve. Remember back in Genesis chapter 3, 
Paul is using that same story from back in the Old Testament. But I fear unless by any means as a serpent or Satan beguiled or tricked Eve through his subtlety trickery. Satan's, Satan's tricky. He's not going to come in here in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork, is he? He's going to come in here and look like the most mild-mannered, nice, sweet person you could be. And that's the way Satan tricks churches. The most loving, sweetest pastor in the world. And he tricks you. Compare everything with God's word. Don't let yourself be fooled. Be careful. So, by fear, unless by any means is a serpent, Satan, tricked Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's so simple. He says right there, your minds can be corrupted from the simplicity. It's so simple. Don't let it be corrupted. Don't let this happen to you. Let us make sure we stand right. So, when Paul was talking to this guy that, to, that controlled the jails in Philippi, called the Philippian jailer, and this Philippian jailer came to Paul and says, what must I do to be saved? What did Paul tell him? What did he tell him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in the same way with your family. If your family believes on him, they'll be saved also. Is there anything added to that? Read, read that, Acts 16. Read the whole story. If there was more to it, wouldn't Paul have said more? Why would Paul leave things out? He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Believe that he's the Savior, that he died on the cross for you. It can't be any more simple. Now, you've all heard of this before, right? The cart before the horse. Okay, ridiculous, right? Let me ask you. We had some math last week. It's simpler this week. Everybody know what 2 plus 2 is? Everybody know what, everybody know what 2 plus 2 is? Okay. 4, right, Jason? Okay. <laughs> 2 plus 2 is 4. Pretty simple, right? X equals 4. If you add something to the gospel before you get saved, then 1 plus X no longer equals 4, does it? Does it? 2 plus 2 equals 4, but if you add something to X, it doesn't equal 4 anymore. The cart before the horse. Here's what a lot of people say, and we're going to explain this more deeply, but I just want to give you one illustration now. I went to a church where the pastor would say, it's like you're going in this direction, then you have to turn around and go in this direction. Trust me. Doesn't that sound like Reformation? What does that truly mean? I'm going in this direction, and I have to turn around and go this direction and trust Christ as Savior. Isn't that saying I have to do something before I trust Christ as Savior? Isn't that saying I have to either hate sin or turn against sin? What does that literally mean? Well, it means that if you're an alcoholic, you need to quit being an alcoholic. If you're on drugs, you're going to quit drugs. If you're abusing your wife, quit abusing your wife. If you're lying and stealing from your company, quit lying and stealing from your company, then trust Christ as Savior. That illustration, if you ever see that, you're going in this direction, and you have to go this direction, run. That is not the gospel. That is one plus the gospel. It's no longer four, no longer is X equal four, is it? People do that all the time. Put stuff before the cart to add it to, to the gospel. Instead of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, do something, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Everybody understand that? Pretty simple, right? Well, can you put the cart, can you put the horse after the cart? Some people do that too, which is dumb. The horse is after the cart. What does that mean? Well, there's some people that say, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, if you are saved, you're automatically going to serve. No, we have a choice. And many people don't serve. And they call this lordship salvation. You'll make Jesus Lord of your life to be saved. Okay? So, you get saved, you have to make Jesus Lord of your life. What, what, at what point do you receive eternal life? The second you believe, the second you trust. Just like that, you have eternal life. Yes, discipleship. We should make Jesus Lord of our life. We should follow along and serve him all we can. But that's a lifelong endeavor, isn't it? That doesn't keep you saved or make you saved. So please, that's why I'm doing this. The gospel needs to be clear and simple as possible, as it said there in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. And that's what I'm trying to get across in these next 10 weeks. We're going to get a good grasp of this, a real good understanding of this. So when you hear a false gospel on the radio, on television, from a friend, sitting in a church, whatever, you'll pick it up just like that. That's the goal. Because it says in Hebrews 5.14 that we should go from milk to meat and have discernment. It also says in Philippians 1 verse 9 and 10 that as we grow and we mature and we learn more, we should have discernment. That's a good word, discernment. We need discernment. We need to distinguish between right and wrong. We need to understand if somebody's trying to give us a 5.9% mortgage and we see a 6.4, we need to jump up and say something's wrong. Or they give you the wrong medicine when you go to the doctor. Something's wrong. So that's what... It should be the same thing with the gospel and the truth of what the Bible says too, shouldn't it? Romans 11:6. that verse says, um, if it is grace, it is no longer works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. If it is of works, it is no longer 
grace, otherwise works is no longer works. It separates the two. It's either one or the other. How do they mend this stuff and make this stuff make sense? Well, people just sit there like sheep, bah, bah, and they believe it and they listen to it because the guy speaks so sweetly. Please, I'm asking you to be very careful about this because that's the key that we want to understand here. So, our last slide. And this is where you're at, Galatians chapter... No, it isn't. Okay, X equals 4 plus 1. But our last slide, Galatians 1 verse 8 and 9, if you're there. And you, I want you to see it in your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, now when you turn there, I'm going to show you that. I'll put it up on the screen too, but I want you to see that it's actually in the Bible. It truly is. Okay. These verses, Paul had a reason for putting these in the book of Galatians because they, this is one of the earlier books written and they, they drifted away already, these Galatian believers. The gospel is simple. Believe on, the, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ plus nothing. And that's something that's so easy for us to understand. The verse says, Paul said, but though we, even himself, though we are an angel from heaven. Now that's not talking about a fallen angel. Now I'm sure fallen angels will go around and try to deceive people all along. That's talking about an angel from heaven that is there, I believe, at the right hand of God. If, if that angel comes down and gives you a different gospel, don't believe him. And he says, do we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel? Any other gospel? Unto you then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's pretty serious, isn't it? That is what he is saying in Galatians 1 verse 8. What does he say in verse 9? Why does he have to say it again? You get it, right? Well, I think he's trying to drive it home. And he says, as we said before, so I now, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. Bad word, accursed. It means anathema. A man accursed, devoted to the direst of woes, without hope of being redeemed. If it's an animal, it is to be slain. Therefore, a person or thing doomed to destruction. Now, just to tell you, can a saved person give a bad gospel and get mixed up? Yes, they can. They really can. They can, they can trust Christ as Savior and later on hear something and fall into it and give unclear gospels. They won't go to hell, but boy, they're going to they're gonna stand before Christ someday and they're going to be punished for it. And that's the sad thing about this. But many people stand in pulpits and you wonder, are they even saved? And they give a false gospel. And it says to be accursed right here. And so, notice this. Any other gospel, not just a deviation of it or a change of it, be accursed. Any other gospel, let him be accursed. Okay, the, in the text here, in the context, that's talking about anathema, lake of fire, hell. I mean, let him be accursed. Please, it, that's how serious this is, people. It's very serious. Um, do you understand how serious this is? I mean... Please, if you ever hear something that's a little bit different and it's not so clear, pay attention and think about it. Um, this is reality. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about Jesus Christ coming to this earth and God sending him to the cross for your sins. I love Romans 1.16. I love this gospel. Nobody's going to change it. I'm going to stand strong on it. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Only one gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and that's the gospel that's clear and simple. Uh, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. The gospel has power. Romans, 11, Romans 13, verse 11 says, and this is something for us to remember, Romans 13, 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Do you realize every day, tick-tock, 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 we get closer and closer. We're getting closer to our ultimate um, salvation. When we're in heaven, we have our new bodies, and we're there with God forever. But you know what? The only time we have to do anything for Christ is right now. And that's what's important. Because could you imagine getting to heaven and have somebody coming up to you and say, thank you so much for giving me that track. I understood it. Could you imagine somebody that came to you and says, thank you for inviting me to church to me here in the gospel? Seriously. I mean, how, do you all understand how, how amazing that's going to be? to see these people. And so that's our job right now, is to keep the gospel and clear and as simple as possible. So these next nine weeks, we're going to go through this and we're going to explain everything that's not the gospel and everything that is the gospel. And my whole goal is to be a good teacher and help us all to understand it, okay? And to keep it clear and simple. So let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. And I know sometimes talking about hell is not the most pleasant thing to talk about. And it kind of shocks us and scares us. 
but it is a reality, and we can't put our heads in the sand. We've got to realize it's true. Just like heaven is real, and we want to be in heaven, we don't want our friends or people we know to be in hell. We need to get the gospel out. We need to tell them. We need to talk to them. Just anything that you can do to be positive toward this clear gospel, do it. And that's so important because someday it'll be too late for us to do this anymore. So we need to do it now. And if anyone here today wants to trust Christ as Savior, in the simpleness of your mind, all you have to do is talk to the living God, letting them know that you know that you're a sinner and you trust him as your personal Savior. If you do that, he promises you eternal right life right now. So if you've done that, you can know for sure you're going to heaven for all eternity. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.